Welcome, welcome to the Mysterious Book Emporium. Last time, Merrick and company journeyed deep in the abyss of the Dwarven Deep Roads and made it out and back just in time to fight the Orlesians with the Rebel Army. While Guerin was defended, what happens now? How will Merrick win back his throne? Why don't you take a seat as we continue on with the final part of The Stolen Throne, Chapter 17 through the Epilogue. Chapter 17 we open up to a stormy night in Guerin, Merrick slaving away on letters and Loghain watching him. The Battle of Guerin wasn't easy and many of the locals were slaughtered by the Orlesians during the riot, which greatly disturbed Merrick. He had insisted on helping clean up the town and joining funeral rites, which gained him the love and even worship of the locals, but this also disturbed him. Seeing their devotion to him made the stakes even more tangible. Loghain eventually speaks up, saying that he needs to talk to Merrick about Catrio. Merrick is a bit prickly on the subject, aware that both Rowan and Loghain do not trust or like her. Loghain begins asking Merrick what he is doing with her. What is Merrick's plan? Will he make her his queen? What about Rowan? Merrick fires back that he might make her queen, but more importantly, he knows about Loghain and Rowan. After a pause, Loghain tells Merrick to go after Rowan. Merrick, shocked and confused, questions Loghain, of all people, how he could ask that to which Loghain replies that he knows she still loves Merrick. The two argue over Merrick's love life, Merrick defending his relationship with Catriel, saying that she sees Merrick as the man he is, rather than how Rowan sees the boy he was. Merrick then states that he does wish to make Catriel his queen, and that people are just going to have to accept that. And then Loghain tells him that he had people follow Catriel. Loghain has word from his scouts that Catriel didn't go to Amaranthing, as she said, but rather Denerim. To the royal palace. Catriel works for the Orlesians. Merrick has a hard time believing it at first. In his silence, Loghain tells Merrick that he will have to make some hard decisions as king. While he loves Catriel, she is a spy against him. And here, as Loghain predicted, Catriel comes in, dripping wet from the rain. It's obvious she knows something is wrong, but is not sure what yet, and she heads over to Merrick, who looks extremely distraught, to ask if he's alright. Merrick confronts her about going to Denerim, and she doesn't deny it. She begins to weep as she confesses that she has been working against them, but she did try to tell Merrick he just didn't want to listen to her. Merrick's devastation turns into fury, asking her to tell him now. In the silence between them, Catriel begs Merrick not to make her say it and destroy what they have, but he is firm. He needs to know. And in her explanation, she admits to causing the disaster at West Hill. In tears, Merrick turns to Loghain, admitting that his friend was right all along. He then turns to Catriel and roars at her to get out, but she doesn't. He yells at her again, this time drawing his magical sword, his entire body shaking. But she doesn't. This time, inching closer to him. She begs him to believe that, despite everything, she does love him. And this makes Merrick snap. If you believe nothing else, my prince, she whispered calmly. You must believe that I love you. Must I? He raised his sword sharply to bar her away. You dare. He set his jaw firmly, refusing to retreat any further. She stepped forward again, her eyes solemnly fixed upon him. Letting out a scream of blind rage, Merrick rushed towards Catriel with his blade raised high. The runes pulsated as he halted in front of her, sword poised over his head. She didn't flinch, didn't retreat, didn't attempt to stop his swing. She merely stared at him, tears coming down her cheeks. He lowered the blade to his side, his knuckles white as his hands shook. He couldn't stand to look at her, but couldn't look away. Catriel closed the last distance between them to gently touch Merrick's face. She said nothing. His whole body began to shake violently. With a cry of anguish and rage, he threw off her hand and suddenly ran her through. And Catriel is dead. Merrick catches her body, yelling at Loghain to help him, to help her, but Loghain doesn't move. Stop, he said. His tone was firm. She betrayed you, Merrick. She betrayed all of us. This is justice. Justice, Merrick repeated hollowly. Loghain nodded grimly. Justice that a king must dispense, whether it pleases him or not. Merrick replies that he shouldn't be king, not after everything he has done, and Loghain slaps him, telling him that her treachery warranted this. Merrick stands, sickened, and stumbles out of the room, saying he needs to be alone. 
Rowan stands by her window watching the storm pass by when Loghain walks in. She asks him how the confrontation with Merrick went, to which he coolly responds that Catriel is dead, which shocks Rowan. Here we learn from Rowan that Loghain forgot to mention a few things. That Loghain had known Catriel had went to Denrim not to bring new information, but to cut ties with the Orlesians, and that Catriel now has a price on her head. But he had kept all of that a secret from Merrick, because it didn't change the fact in his mind that she needed to die. Rowan expresses doubts that maybe Catriel really did love Merrick, to which Loghain explains that he doesn't believe they were wrong. Rowan becomes angry at Loghain, telling him that the elven woman saved them, and that if nothing else, Merrick loved her. How could Loghain coach him into killing her? But as she thinks, she realizes that she had helped. That she was just as guilty as Loghain. How could she do this to him? He then turns to Rowan, and although he tries his best to stay cool, the pain is evident in his voice. He tells her that Merrick will either wallow in self-pity or realize that a good man and a good king are not always the same thing. And he needs help. He needs Rowan. He needs his queen. Rowan is furious, saying that she doesn't want to be his queen. Loghain tells her to be Ferelden's queen then. Both know that this is it. The end of them. And Rowan is angry. She hates that she begins to cry and pounds her fists into Loghain's chest. As her eyes meet, they lean into a kiss, but Rowan pulls away at the last second. And then Rowan leaves Loghain to go help Merrick. She finds him on his bed, just staring into the blackness of his room. When he realizes Rowan has entered, he speaks to her. When he turned to her, his eyes were sunken with grief. It's just as the witch said it would be, he blurted out. I thought she was just making no sense, but what witch? Rowan asked, confused. He barely heard her, looking off into the shadows again. You will hurt the ones you love the most, he quoted, and become what you hate in order to save what you love. Rowan comforts Merrick, thinking that there was a time she would have died for this, but now she wants anything but. She holds him as he confesses what he did, and Rowan begins to think. She continued to hold him, and after a time he quieted and they held each other in the shadows. Rowan lent him her strength, what little of it she had to give. He needed it. Perhaps this was what queens did. Perhaps they held their kings in the darkness deep within their castles and allowed them that moment of weakness they could never show to anyone else. Perhaps they gave strength to their kings because everyone else only took it from them. In the darkness, Rowan leads down to kiss Merrick, him hungry for her forgiveness, and she gives it. Tonight she would be the strength he needed, because that's the way it had to be. Chapter 18 Merrick waits alone in a dark chantry, thinking back on the past few days. Rowan has been very attentive since their night in Guerin, but this isn't the same Rowan. There is a wall between them designed to keep him out. After the rioting around Ferelden, there was a massive execution around the nation, which didn't help the rioting at all. Bands from all around started to join the rebel army, even an Orlesian band came and begged to be accepted into the rebel army, promising to marry and become Ferelden. Loghain comes in then with a group of men, the bands that betrayed Merrick's mother. The men are noticeably nervous, their leader, Banserolik, sweating profusely. Merrick nods to Loghain, who is standing in front of the exit. Merrick thinks on how the relationship has changed too, and that perhaps, permanently, there is now a rift between them. But that's how it had to be, because there is nothing left than what had to be done. Merrick talks to the bands, with Ban Serilic admitting that they didn't expect his proposal. That proposal being, give all their men to the rebel army, give supplies, and denounce the Elysian king, and in return, amnesty. Ban Serilic argues that it's a lot to give in exchange, and wonders if he means to offer anything else. Merrick counters that the group had committed regicide, a crime punishable by death, and that the offer they had was generous. After a bit of arguing, Merrick draws his sword. A younger band of Ravani complexion called Ban Kir mocks Merrick, that there would be no way Merrick would murder them in a holy chantry. Merrick needs their armies, and needs them to say yes. If they are killed here, their families would never give in to the rebel cause. Do you really think the noble Prince Merrick would kill us here, where everyone would know it? He chuckled lightly. What would people think? Merrick smiled coldly. They would think it was justice. 
he said, and barely taking a step, he spun around and lashed out with a dragon bone blade, cleanly severing Ban Kier's head at the neck. The bands are outraged that Merrick would murder in front of Andraste, but Merrick and Loghain then begin to murder all of them. Ban Serilic, the last one standing, begs for forgiveness on his knees, telling Merrick that he will give him anything he wants, and Merrick orders him to stand and pick up his sword. The king kills him, telling the band that what he wants, he cannot give. As Merrick and Loghain stand in the carnage, Loghain mentions that the bands weren't that wrong. There will be an outcry of what they did here, but Merrick doesn't care. This moment will send a message that there is no more forgiveness from the rebel army. You are either with them or you are an enemy. In two days time, the Orlesian men will be coming towards the River Dane, the opposing charge being led by Loghain and Rowan. Loghain questions Merrick's decisions not to be in the battle, but Merrick just shoots back that what he will be doing instead needs to be done. The two leave as Merrick feels his heart calm, leaving only an icy silence, and the flame in the Chantry brazier being blown out. Chapter 19 A dragon is flying in the early morning for Elden Sky. Loghain watches from afar as it flies around the Frostbag Mountains. This isn't the first time the dragon has been spotted, as apparently has been tearing apart the Orlegian countryside. We learn that the Chantry has decided to name the next age Dragon Age, with Loghain thinking about how silly it sounds. Rowan walks up to join Loghain, commenting on the beauty of the beast. Rowan still had not forgiven Loghain, and probably never will. She tells him that she has news. Denerim is burning, King Megrin is unsure how to proceed, but most importantly, the Chantry has declared Merrick the rightful king of Ferelden. As expected, some nobles were offended by the slaughter in the Chantry, but the move ended up gaining them more help than costing. Loghain looks to Rowan, trying not to notice how beautiful she looks in her armor. She asks if they are truly about to battle without Merrick, to which he only replies that he is doing what he thinks he must. Two hours later, standing in front of nearly a thousand men and the Legion of the Dead, and wearing his old leathers for luck, Loghain gives a speech to rally them against the oncoming Orlesian army. There was a dragon in the sky, he shouted to the men, his voice competing with the whistling wind. I saw it myself, flying in the mountains. If dragons can rise from defeat, my friends, then why not Ferelden? The army howled its approval, raising swords and spears and shaking them until finally Loghain held up his hand. It feels good to fight, he shouted, to stand up to those Arlesian bastards and tell them no more. They howled again, and Loghain raised his voice even further. Your prince is not here, but when he returns to us, we shall hand to him his stolen throne. Here at the River Dane is where the Dragon Age begins, my friend. Today they will hear us roar. And we jump to Severin, sitting alone in his tent and complaining about the cold. He thinks on how annoying it is that he has to await for another bard to show when a man enters his tent. It only takes a moment for him to realize that it's Merrick. The two exchange a few words before Merrick makes it clear that he has come to kill him. The two battle, with Merrick struggling to fight against Severin's magical power. And Severin asks how Merrick even found him. And we learn that he actually got the information from Catriel. Merrick flings a strange dust at Severin, and he realizes too late that the mysterious powder is beginning to feel familiar, as he notices a buzzing sensation in the back of his head and his power begin to weaken. As Severin is starting to feel these effects, Merrick tells him that this was all a gift from Catriel, that she had left him a letter explaining everything about him, where to find him, and how to defeat him, all before Merrick finally kills him. When Merrick confirms that the mage is dead, he quietly thanks Catriel. Thank you, Catriel, he murmured, and felt the grief welling up inside him. He had found the letter in the tiny chest in her quarters the next morning, left by her out in the open where he couldn't possibly miss it. She had known. She had known she was followed to Denerim. She had known what awaited her when she returned. She had written that there could be no forgiveness for what she had done, and then she had explained in detail how Severin could be approached and killed. Without him, she had written, the usurper is lost, and then she had wished him well. Merrick is then found by two Orlesian guards who had come to check out the commotion, and Merrick easily slices them down and escapes into the night. He thinks about how Megrin is next, 
and that he wishes to face him alone because if he has done anything right at all, it was the chance for Merrick to meet Catriel. Merrick is coming for his stolen throne, and no one will stand in his way. Epilogue Years later, a 12-year-old Caelan asks an aging Mother Alice if his father, King Merrick, won the war. She chuckles at the obvious question. Yes, they did. Mother Alice tells the young prince that Loghain led the army to victory at Riverdane, becoming the hero of Riverdane. The Legion of the Dead was all killed, and Rowan, Caelan's mother, almost died. But while Rowan did survive that battle, she did pass not too long ago. We're not exactly sure what caused her illness, but some rumors exist that it was her time in the Deep Roads that caused the wasting illness she had. We also learn what happened in the final days of the war. Three years after the last chapter ends, the army marches into Denrim, and King Megrin locks himself away in Fort Dragon for six days before Merrick challenges him to a duel for the throne. The two fought on the roof of the fort, and obviously, Merrick wins. Megrin's head is the last head placed outside of Denrim. Caelan also asks if his mother and father loved each other. Mother Alice explains that it's complicated, but they did in the end, pointing to how crushed Merrick was after she died. What Merrick felt for Catriel was just different. We learn that Loghain rarely visited the palace, and Rowan never seemed to forgive or forget him. We also learn that after the war, Loghain had gone in search for what had happened to his father in camp, and that was when he found Sister Alice in a nearby village. The two were overjoyed to have found each other alive, and she brought him to where she buried his father. The book ends with Caelan asking if he will be a good king like his father Merrick the Savior. Mother Alice, his tutor, thinks he will, and smiles as he asks for another story on dragons. Discussion Before we start, let's talk about the artists of the week. I was sent in two images by Flukas, the first being a parody of the cover art, and the second being a rendition of the Scottish Legion of the Dead. We also have a Tumblr user, wannabe artist C, who sent in this lovely drawing of the cover of the novel. And now that we're in the discussion, I will have to say that this is a long one, so buckle up. So let's just start with the obvious thing to talk about. Catriel is dead. I'll say that this was my second read-through of the novel, but damn, Gator wasn't subtle on his intentions of her. I sprinkled a few of the foreshadowing in the reviews, but there was a bit more. Catriel was definitely going to die. And I want to talk about this death because it's the catalyst to a lot in Merrick's life. Or really everybody's life. This was how Merrick was hardened, if we're going to use the game terms. This was the moment Merrick becomes King Merrick, who did what needed to be done. I know a lot of you don't like hardening Alistair in the game because you need to be mean to him, which I would even argue against that, but still, I want you to consider the differences. Get told off by the woman you think is your sister, realize you have no family again and that perhaps you are too optimistic, versus finding out the woman you love is a spy for the enemy and that she caused a major military defeat and that you need to kill her for justice for the nation. I'm just saying that Alistair seemed to get the same message but got off way easier. <laughs> her death was also solidifying the distance between Loghain and Merrick's relationship. While the two were best friends during the three years in the novel, I think Merrick realizes that Flemeth was right in the end, that he will betray him. I don't think that he ever really forgave Loghain either, and I don't think Loghain really forgave himself. Catriel's death was also the reason Rowan went to Merrick. This is actually brought up earlier, but I saved it for this moment here. Lucas says, The more I play slash read slash watch YouTube videos on Dragon Age, the more convinced I am that the core theme of the entire series is loss, grief, how to deal with it, what happens when someone doesn't cope well, and how others do. There's a lot of loss in Thetis. Dorvan's empire falls from the dark spawn and lost history. The elven and first the loss of Arlathan followed by the Dales and the loss of their new homeland. In Stolen Throne is the loss of Ferelden to Arle. Much of the writing, particularly in chapter 13, is devoted to talking about how musing over what different aspects our heroes find in the deep roads. Old carvings on the doors at the cave entrances, Merrick wondering what the domed hall was used for, Catriel being looked down on and what she had to deal with just because she's an elf, etc. And yeah, you know how sometimes in media there are two characters that have conflict just because they didn't talk about what was going on and if they did just say a few things to each other everything would be fine? I think this is sort of Dragony's version of that, if that makes sense. Uh, a lot 
of things would have gone better if people just dealt with their grief in a healthy manner. Lugane wouldn't have fought against the Wardens or the Elysians trying to help them against the Blight, Hawk's mother would still be alive, and Corypheus would have seen the empty throne of the gods and not feel like he needed to replace it with his own butt. In fact, while we are not sure what exactly caused Solus to create the Veil, I would be willing to bet that it relied heavily on mismanaged grief, so almost literally, the world of Thetis could be built on unhealthy coping mechanisms. But I think this is actually a much more realistic worldview than conflict arising from not communicating, although it does happen. Not many people know what to do with their grief, and very often it gets turned into anger, fear, and violence. When talking with Rowan, Merrick mentions that Flemeth predicted what had happened. If you went back and actually read that section, you'll notice that what Merrick just quoted in the chapter isn't said, meaning that it was said when he was in the hut. If you remember back when I was talking about what was said in the hut and the promise he made, I think that what we see here in this chapter is probably what made him afraid and shaken like we see when he exited the hut. But I will say that he spent a long time in there, and so far we only know two little bits from that conversation. Why I still hold that Merrick is not the father of Morrigan, because that is just way too weird, there might be a time where we learn a few more things from Merrick's time in that hut. Or not, I don't know, it's just one of those things that they can slip in there if they need it. I want to talk about Rowan's realization on being a queen for a moment because I love it. <laughs> Rowan's entire character was that she hated the idea of being feminine, because to her, femininity was a weakness. There was strength in masculinity, in being a warrior in armor and battle. And at the end here, Rowan discovers strength in classic femininity, in forgiveness and softness and comforting. Rowan fought to be the best person she could be for her nation, and found that it didn't need another warrior, it needed a queen. And I love this about Rowan. We see in media messages about being strong women in battle, which is great and I support that, but the strong women in peace are often overlooked. Let's talk about a small detail at the end of chapter 18. As Merrick and Loghain leave the bloody chantry, the chantry's brazier burns out. This is a great little detail because it's in part one of those you probably only get it if you're ass deep in lore touches, but then also it's still pretty obvious. You see in the Chantry, the flame is seen as a symbol for purity and as a representation of Andraste. Each Chantry holds a brazier that has an eternal flame that is never supposed to go out. Sometimes, if they have the ability to, the flame is even magically kept. It going out is both a symbol for Merrick losing his purity and Andraste leaving Merrick's heart in the Chantry itself. So I left it out of the summary, but when we learn that the Chantry announced that Merrick was the rightful king of Ferelden, Rowan and Loghain begin to make fun of Mother Bronark, imagining her giving her declaration from the window of her carriage as she sped off to safety. And we don't really ever find out if she chose to do this because she really believed in Merrick or she found Megrin was about to lose and change sides. Either way, this is the last we hear of Mother Bronark, and I have no idea what happens to her. Did she die? Did she get replaced? I have no idea. I got a PM from Reddit user Pathogen7 that says, Was the dragon that decimated the Elysian countryside in 899 Blessed actually Flemeth? We know that Merrick struck some sort of deal with Flemeth while he was in the Kokari Wilds. It just seemed like too much of a coincidence that a random dragon to ravage Orle at the exact moment when the most important battle between Orle and Ferelden was about to be fought. Honestly, it could be. There's nothing saying it's not. And I can't find anything that talks about the fate of the dragon in question. And even if it's not Flemeth herself, if we find out that dragon was killed, we know that she does have dragons at her disposal, so it could have been sent from her. It, it's whatever you really want to headcanon at this point. When Severin is attacked by Merrick, Severin uses a few spells by calling out to vent her words. Chanting and spellcasting isn't talked about much in the Dragon Age series, but from what I gather, the spoken spell isn't really that important. It's almost used like a chant to concentrate your mind on what you want to do. He probably could use magic without it, but he just doesn't for some reason. This is going into theory, but I think that the Three most possible explanations for this could be A, he likes to show off that he is a mage, so he makes it very obvious that he's working a spell. B, he's actually not that good with concentrating when casting. Or C, this is just something that changed in development. 
I think B is sort of interesting because you could read it as he's just a shitty wizard, but perhaps mages with ADHD or other concentration problems just need to use more spoken spells than non-mages. When Merrick kills Severin, we get his final thoughts. No, this cannot be how it ends. Not like this. He tried to bring to mind a spell that might save him, a healing spell or even a right to pull his spirit from his body and preserve it. As you might have guessed, it's the last line that interests me. Pull the spirit from the body and preserve it? Is this a common spell? How did he know it? Is it that easy and fast to cast that there was a chance he could do it had his magic not been dampened? If he was able to do it, would it even be able to do anything with his spirit? Or would he just be trapped in whatever object he chose? I just have a lot of questions about this line with very little answers. As the epilogue reveals, Kaylin has a little picture book of what had happened during the events of the novel. What's interesting is that the book is from the newly crowned Empress of Orlais, Celine, in an effort for peace. I sort of find it weird to think about because later in the Dragon Age Origins DLC Return to Ostagar, we find letters that because Nora was not producing children, Kaylin has started to move forward with a plan to marry Empress Selene for peace between the two nations. And Empress Selene was in on it as well. But all of that aside, this doesn't actually line up with the timeline. Selene and Kaylin are supposed to be just one year apart, which would make Selene about 11 years old when she gained the throne of Orlais. While she did become empress at 16 years old, this is still way too early. Ideally, the easiest way to fix this is just make Selene a lot older than she says, which would make a lot of sense with other things, but that topic is for another day. Also, right at the beginning of the chapter, we learn that Sister Alice has now become Mother Alice. It's a subtle change, meaning that she now heads a chantry in the area. I don't know if she replaced Mother Bronark, or if even in the book she means to say the Mother title is for like the Grand Cleric now, or if that's changed in development, but at least how we know now, the title of Mother is for a woman who runs the chantry. A chantry, not the chantry as a whole, that's the divine. When Mother Alice is talking about the timeline for when Megrin was defeated, this actually conflicts with the date in the world of Thetis books, which lists it as 900 Dragon rather than 902 Dragon. As for which one is correct, I'm not sure. As you have seen me talk about time and time again, the Stolen Throne has a lot of errors. And while World of Thetis Volume 1 isn't perfect, they did go back and correct the mistakes in World of Thetis Volume 2, and this was not included in the edits. I know some of you think the world of Thetis is just garbage for information and some of you even told me to stop using it, but I think the purpose of the world of Thetis books was to try and mesh together everything in the series into one coherent piece of lore. So it changes a lot because a lot didn't mesh together in the series. So while personally I'm inclined to believe world of Thetis, the choice is up to you. While Kaelin is talking to Mother Alice, he mentions that Fort Draken is inside a mountain. I think this is one of those things changed in development, as the Fort Draken we see in the game is just a tower. As Anana was quick to point out, Mother Alice has also seemed to tell little Kaelin about his father's love life. And that's... really weird? I guess it's a nice little nod to us to, that we know that Rowan and Merrick did love each other, but... It's still really weird, and Anna also thinks it's really, really weird, and I totally agree with her. It's like, I, 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 it, nah, it's so strange. <laughs> hey, little Kaylin, let me tell you about the time your dad fucked a cat tree in a cave. Also, how did she know that? Wasn't that private information? Don't you think that they would have had a cover up? of, of Catriel's uh, romance with Merrick, or did Mother Alice just find out? And why would you tell a little boy that? Because if it was covered up, then he's just going to spill it out to everyone. It's just a terrible idea and doesn't make any sense. <laughs> and it's also just bad for children. Don't go around telling your children who you're fucking. Holy shit, that's so strange. And at the end here, let's discuss what happened with the Stolen Throne Square. Overall, I think Reddit user Ally the Randomizer said it best. While I understand the reasoning behind the various actions that they had taken in this last section of the book, it does not stop the fact that I still feel for them and want them to have had a better hand dealt. All three had made all of these sacrifices in order to complete their duties to the people of Ferelden. How their relationship dynamics change in the ending of the book made it feel more realistic, which is something that I've come to admire in regards to Dragon Age and all of its mediums. Let's start with Loghain for a bit. We've gotten a lot of comments about how people find it hard to see how Loghain in the novel and Loghain in the game are the same person. I think an email I got from Blue helps clear this up a bit. 
At the beginning of the novel, the author David Gator shows Loghain's distrust of Merrick through his actions and dialogue. Rather than just stating that he is wary, the author shows in long pauses in dialogue and hesitation and the occasional strike on Merrick. A reader starts to see his shift to patriotism when Loghain swears himself in service to his prince, and when he slays Ban Donnell for suggesting that they work against the rebellion. A reader will also recognize that Loghain's grasp on his morals starts to slip when he allows Merrick to kill Catriel even though she no longer poses a significant threat to the rebellion. Because in his eyes, a previous offense is no different than a current one. He becomes unable to forgive any transgression against the rebellion and later on Ferelden. This is why he betrays Caelan at the Battle of Ostagar. He says Caelan's attempt to unite the nations against the Blight as a threat to Ferelden's independence. He cannot let Caelan undo the work that so many of his friends and family perished to achieve, even though the threat was small. Adding to this, many of you also say, how could he do that to the child of the woman he loved? Loghain did love Rowan, but he loved Ferelden more. That's why he was able to give her up at the end. So with that in mind, Loghain devoted himself fully to Ferelden, just as he promised, which created a wall between him and Rowan and Merrick, and I would also say Loghain's morals. Catriel is dead, a fate she knew was coming and accepted, but I do think she loved Merrick in the end. Merrick, persuaded by Loghain, has been hardened to the world and I think even slightly resents his friend for it. He will regret what happened with Catriel for the rest of his life. While he did end up loving Rowan, it was the love of friendship and companionship. It's complicated and messy and different from Catriel, but he did love and depend on her. Just a different type of love. Rowan never forgave Loghain for what he did to Merrick and for helping her do the same. She never forgave him for just letting her go so easily. It seemed that while she loved Merrick, there would always be an unspoken distance between them, a knowledge that this wasn't supposed to be the outcome, but this is the one the country needs and that they will make the best of it. Overall, Catriel is dead and this very tight friendship of Rowan, Merrick, and Loghain is just gone, completely defeated because of what needs to be done for the country. The Novel I've been saving this for last, but now that we have gone through the novel as a whole, let's talk about the cover just a bit. While the font and text styles change a bit with what version you have, most, if not all, have the same cover art. The most notable figures are Loghain and Merrick fighting side by side, and Merrick has his magic sword raised high and bloodied. The shadowy figures in the back are Rowan and Catriel, but I find it interesting that both women are facing the same way as their respective preferred lovers. I also take the fact that they are blurry and hard to make out, perhaps a clue to their fates in the novel. If we follow Merrick's royal purple cape, perhaps the one given to him by either his mother, although that would probably be bloodied and mostly destroyed by now, or Rowan at the end, it wraps around to the shadowy figures of a large army in the back, but I'm not sure if this is the rebel army or the Orlesian one. I also find the moon and star background a little curious as I felt that night wasn't a really important factor in the novel, but that could just be artish interpretation what they wanted to put, I, I don't know. Overall, I really like this cover. It's definitely one of my favorites in the series. I think the fact that the main characters get a large section of the front and the army gets so little tells you exactly what you'll be expecting in the book. Let's also talk about when this was released because I've gotten a few comments about it. The novel itself was released on March 3rd, 2009, nine months before Dragon Age Origins was released. And honestly, I think this explains a lot of the inconsistencies within the book. Using the Amazon rating system, it averages out to just about a 4.2 out of 5 stars, which, as we'll find out as we go on, is just barely the lowest rated Dragon Age novel. Which I will say, something to keep in mind here, this is David Gator's first novel. So, I don't know if I'll give you some brownie points or not, but maybe something you'd want to know. So, because none of you asked, what is my personal ranking for The Stolen Throne? I originally read the novels back to back about two-ish years ago, so it's it's been a while. Um, as we go along with the book emporium, I'm probably going to be editing this ranking, but for the moment, I'm betting that Stolen Throne is going to be at my number four on the list of best Dragon Age novels for me. 
While the book didn't add a whole lot of lore to the world like others will, the character development just really shines. I have some doubts on some of the strategy that worked in the battles and how lucky Merrick is, which the novel does poke fun at, I'll admit that. But even after I knew exactly what was going to happen and with a bunch of inconsistencies about the established world of Thetis, I still had a lot of fun watching the disastrous Stolen Throne Square evolve and degrade. As was mentioned earlier by Ali the Randomizer, to me, Dragon Age is about the stories of flawed people, and this is exactly that. It's a great addition to the series, and it's only in the number four slot for me because I like the lore established in the other novels just a little bit better. And with that, thank you to everyone who submitted entries, and I look forward to what everyone comes up with next time for the first episode of The Calling, the only direct sequel in the Dragon Age line of novels. If you have any comments, questions, artwork, or anything else you want to submit, please send it in. Our next section will consist of chapters one through four, and please send me your comments, artwork, anything <laughs> um, by June 3rd, 2018. Either comment below, send me an email at gildarthon at gmail.com, tweet Gildarthon on Twitter, or PM user Gillanon on Reddit. Duress your all.